Hey Spartan Nation, I am um, back. I'm going to read a little bit from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe and review some of the presidents and states and capitals. So our first president of the United States was George Washington. He served two terms and um, his birthday was in February for those of you interested in birthdays. Uh, John Adams was our second president of the United States. He only served one term and he... Um, his birthday was in October, so if you have an October birthday, you share it with our second president, John Adams. Our third president was Thomas Jefferson. He served two terms in office, and his birthday was in April. So those of us that celebrate April birthdays, his was April 13th. And he had two vice presidents. He had Aaron Burr and George Clinton as his vice presidents. Aaron Burr is actually a relative of mine. Um, of course, I didn't know him because he lived way before I did. And George Clinton was his second VP. Back in the day, vice presidents were actually elected into office as well, just like the president is elected. So um, <clears throat> it wasn't just um, um, a bill that you, you know, you vote for the president, you automatically get the vice president. Well, talking about that, James Madison... He was our fourth president of the United States, and James Madison's first vice president was Thomas Jefferson's second vice president, Clint, uh, George Clinton, <clears throat> and um, he served two terms in office. James Monroe, he served two terms in office as well. And so that leads us into our uh, next president of the United States, our seventh president of the United States. And I want you to think about that at the end. I'll come back and we'll talk about that. And the reason that I'm showing you the pictures is because I had some uh, shout outs saying, Miss Hamer, we want to see what those presidents look like. Um, so um, I wanted to show you those. Now, the pictures that I've been showing you were from paintings because there were no photographs um, at that time. So I've showed you the pictures that I've shown you have been copies from paintings from that time. All right, so I'm going to move into The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Some of you have been working on your uh, states and capitals. Connecticut is at the next state that we're going to talk about, and so I want you to think about what the capital of Connecticut is, and at the end, we'll talk about it. All right, well, last time that I read from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, we stopped on Chapter 9, <clears throat> and now we are on Chapter 10. Uh, Edmund uh, got away from the rest of the crew, he found the White Witch, and so he is now with the White Witch. The others have discovered that he has disappeared, and they think that he probably has gone to the White Witch. So they are leaving uh, the Beaver's uh, home, and they are going to find um, some other place to, to camp out overnight because they don't want to be caught. They are going to meet Aslan, if you remember, at the stone table. So that's where they want to meet Aslan the, um, <clears throat> the next day. And we know that um, Edmund heard that part because he told the White Witch what the, the plans were. All right, so this takes us to Chapter 10. The spell begins to break. <clears throat> Excuse me, I don't know why I've got a little frog in my throat. Now, we must go back to Mr. and Mrs. Beaver and the three other children. As soon as Mr. Beaver said, There's no time to lose. Everyone began began bundle everyone began bundling themselves into coats, except Mrs. Beaver, who started picking up sacks and laying them on the table and said, Now, Mr. Beaver, just reach down that ham and, and here's a packet of tea and there's sugar and some matches, and if someone uh We'll get two or three loaves out of the crock over there in the corner. <clears throat> what are you doing, Mrs. Beaver, exclaimed Susan. Packing a load for each of us, dearie, said Mrs. Beaver very coolly. You didn't think we'd set out on a journey with nothing to eat, did you? <clears throat> but we haven't time, said Susan, buttoning the collar of her coat. She may be here any m minute. <clears throat> That's what I say, chimed in Mr. Beaver. Get along with you all, said his wife. Think it over, Mr. Beaver. She can't be here for a quarter of an hour at least. But don't we want a big, as big a stotch as we can possibly get, said Peter. 
if we're to reach the stone table before her? You've got to remember that, Mrs. Beaver, said Susan. As soon as she has looked in here and finds we're gone, she'll be off at top speed. That she will, said Mrs. Beaver, but we can't get there before her. Whenever we do, for she'll be on a sledge and we'll be walking. Then we, have we any hope? said Susan. Now don't you get fussy. There's a dear, said Mrs. Beaver, but just get a half a dozen clean handkerchiefs out of the drawer. Of course we've got hope. We can't get there before her, but we can keep under cover and go by ways she won't expect, and perhaps we'll get enough. That's true enough, Mrs. Beaver, said her husband, but it's time we get out of this. And don't you start fussing either, Mr. Beaver, said his wife. There, that's better. There's five loads, and the smallest for the smallest of us. That's you, my dear, she, she added, looking at Lucy. Oh, do please come on, said Lucy. We'll be nearly ready now, answered Mrs. Beaver at last, allowing her husband to help her into her snow boots. <clears throat> I suppose the sewing machine is too heavy to bring. Yes, it is, said Mr. Beaver. A great deal too heavy, and you don't think you'll be able to use it while we're on the run, I suppose. I can't abide the thought of that witch fiddling with it, said Mrs. Beaver, and breaking it or stealing it, or uh, as likely as not. Oh, please, please, please do hurry, said the three children. And so at last they all got outside, and Mr. Beaver locked the door. It'll delay her her a bit he said and they set off all carrying their loads over their shoulders the snow had stopped and the moon had come out when they began their journey they went in single file first mr beaver then lucy then peter then susan and mrs beaver last of all mr beaver led them across the dam and on to the right bank of the river and then along a very rough sort of path among the trees right down by the river bank the sides of the valley shining in the moonlight towered up far above them on either hand. Let's keep down here as much as possible, he said. She'll have to keep to the top, for you couldn't bring a sledge down here. It would have been pretty enough seen to look at through a window from a comfortable armchair, and even as things were, Lucy enjoyed it at first, but as they went on walking and walking and walking, and as the sack she was carrying felt heavier and heavier. She began to wonder how she was going to keep up at all, and she stopped looking at the dazzling brightness of the frozen river with all its waterfalls of ice and at the white masses of the treetops and the great glaring moon and the countless stars, could only watch the little short legs of Mr. Beaver going pad, 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 pad through the snow in front of her as if they were never going to stop. Then the moonlight disappeared and the snow began to fall once more, and at last Lucy was so tired that she was almost asleep and walking at the same time when suddenly she found that Mr. Beaver had turned away from the river bank to the right and was leading them steeply uphill into the very thickest bushes, and then as she came fully awake she found that Mr. Beaver was just vanishing into a little hole in the bank which had been almost hidden. <clears throat> under the bushes until you were quite on top of it. And here's a picture of Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, Mr. Beaver helping Mrs. Beaver with her snowshoes. In fact, by the time she realized what was happening, only his short, flat tail was showing. Lucy immediately stooped down and crawled in after him. Then she heard voices Noises of scrambling and puffing and panting behind her in the moment all five of them were inside. Whatever is this? said Peter's voice, sounding tired and pale in the darkness. I hope you know what I mean by a voice sounding pale. It's an old hiding place for beavers in bad times, said Mr. Beaver, and a great secret. It's not much of a place, but we must get a few hours sleep. If you hadn't all been in such a plaguey fuss when we were starting, I'd have 
brought some pillows, said Mrs. Beaver. It wasn't nearly such a nice cave as Mr. Tumnus's, Lucy thought, just a hole in the ground, but dry and earthy. It was very small so that when they all lay down, they were all a bundle of clothes together. And what with that and being warmed up by their long walk, they were really rather snug. If only the floor of the cave had been a little smoother. Then Mrs. Beaver handed round in a dark, in the dark, a little flask of, out of which everyone drank something. It made one cough and spurter a little and stung the throat, but it also made you feel deliciously warm after you swallowed it, and everyone went straight to sleep. It seemed to Lucy only the next minute, though really it was hours and hours later, when she woke up feeling a little cold and dreadfully stiff and thinking how she would like a hot bath. Then she felt a set of long whiskers tickling her cheeks and saw the cold daylight coming in through the mouth of the cave. But immediately after that, she was very wide awake indeed, and so was everyone else. In fact, they were all sitting up with their mouths and eyes wide open, listening to a sound, which was the very sound they'd all been thinking and sometimes imagining they heard. During their walk last night, it was the sound of jingling bells. Mr. Beavers was out of the cave like a flash the moment he heard it. Perhaps you think, as Lucy thought for a moment, that this was a very silly thing to do. But it was really a very sensible one. He knew he could scramble to the top of the bank among bushes and brambles without being seen. And he wanted above all things to see which way the witch's sledge went. The others all sat in the cave, waiting and wondering. They waited nearly five minutes. Then they heard something that frightened them very much. They heard voices. <clears throat> oh, thought Lucy, he's been seen. She caught him. Great was their surprise when a little later they heard Mr. Beaver's voice calling to them from just outside the cave. It's all right, he was shouting. Come out, Mrs. Beaver, come out, sons and daughters of Adam. It's all right, it isn't her. This was bad grammar, of course, but that is how beavers talk when they are excited. I mean, in Narnia, in our world, they usually don't talk at all. So Mrs. Beaver and the children came bundling out of the cave, all blinking in the daylight, and with earth all over them and looking very frosty and underbrushed and undercut, uncombed and, and with the sleep still in their eyes. Come on, cried Mr. Beaver. He was almost dancing with delight. Come and see. This is a nasty knot for the witch. It looks as if her power is already crumbling. What do you mean, Mr. Beaver? panted Peter as they all scrambled up the steep bank of the valley together. Didn't I tell you? that she made it always winter and never Christmas? Didn't I tell you? Well, just come and see. And then they were all at the top and did see. It was a sledge, and it was reindeer with bells on their harness. But they were far bigger than the witch's reindeer, and they were not white but brown. And on the sledge sat a person whom everyone knew the moment they set eyes on him. He was a huge man in a bright red robe, bright as holly berries, with a hood <clears throat> that had fur inside it and a great white beard that fell like a foamy waterfall over his chest. Everyone knew him because though you see people of this sort only in Narnia, you see pictures of them and hear them talked about even in our world, the world on this side of the wardrobe door. <clears throat> but you really see them in Narnia, it's rather different. Some of the pictures of Father Christmas in our world make him look all only funny and jolly, but now that the children actually stood looking at him, they didn't find it quite that way. He was so big and so glad and so real that they all became quite still. They felt very glad, but also solemn. I've come at last, he said. She has kept me out for a long time, but I have 
got in at last. Aslan is on the moon. The witch's magic is wake- weakening. And Lucy felt running through her that deep shiver of gladness, which you can only get if you are being solemn and still. And now, said Father Christmas, for your presence. There is a new and better sewing machine for you, Mrs. Beaver. I will drop it off at your house as I pass. Oh, if you please, sir, said Miss, Mrs. Beaver, making a curtsy. It's, it's locked up. <clears throat> Locks and bolts make no difference to me, said Father Christmas. And as for you, Mr. Beaver, when you get home, you will find your dam finished and mended and all the leaks stopped and a new sluice gate fitted. Mr. Beaver was so pleased that that he opened his mouth very wide and then found he couldn't say anything at all. Peter, Adam's son, said Father Christmas. Here, sir, said Peter. These are your presents, was the answer, and they are tools, not toys. The time to use them is perhaps near at hand. Bear them well. With these words, he handed to Peter a shield and a sword. The shield was the color of silver, and across it there was a ramped, a red lion, as bright as a ripe strawberry at the moment when you pick it. The hilt of the sword was of gold, and it had a sheath and a sword belt and everything it needed, and it was just the right size and weight for Peter to use. Peter was silent and solemn as he received these gifts, for he felt that they were a very serious kind of present. Susan! Eve's daughter, said Father Christmas, these are your, these are for you. And he handed her a bow and a quiver full of arrows and a little ivory horn. You must use the bow only in great need, he said, for I do not mean for you to fight in the battle. It does not easily miss, and when you put this horn to your lips and blow it, then wherever you are, I think help of some kind will come to you. Last of all, he said, Lucy, daughter of Eve. And Lucy came forward. He gave her a little bottle of what looked like glass, but people said afterwards that it looked like it was made of a diamond and a small dagger. In this bottle, he said, there is a cordial made of the juice of one of the fire flowers that grow in the mountains of the sun. If you or any of your friends is hurt, a few drops of this will restore them. And the dagger is you is to defend yourself at great need, for you also are not to be in the battle. Why, sir, said Lucy, I think I don't know, but but I think I could be brave enough. That is not the point, he said, but battles are ugly when women fight. And now, here he suddenly looked less grave. Here's something for you, the moment, for the moment for all of you. And he brought out, I suppose, from the big bag, at his back, but nobody quite saw him do it, a large tray containing five cups and saucers, a bowl of lump sugar, a jug of cream, and a great big teapot, all sizzling and piping hot. Then he cried, Merry Christmas! Long live the true king! And cracked his whip, and he and the reindeer and the sledge and all were out of sight before anyone realized that they had started. Peter had just drawn his sword out of its sheath and was showing it to Mr. Beaver when Mrs. Beaver said, Now then, now then, don't stand talking there till the tea's got cold. Just like men, come and help to carry the tray down, and we'll have breakfast. What a mercy! I thought of bringing the bread knife. So down the steep bank they went, and back to the cave, and Mr. Beaver cut some of the bread and ham into sandwiches, and Mrs. Beaver poured out the tea, and everyone enjoyed themselves. But long before they had finished enjoying themselves, Mrs. Beaver said, Mr. Beaver said, time to be moving now. And that's the end of chapter 10. I'll read chapter 11 next time. Chapter 11 is named Aslan is Nearer. So that should be good. Um, <clears throat> let's go back to our... Um, our questions and our seventh president of the United States was Andrew Jackson. And uh, he, he is a, a, a Tennessee boy. 
his nickname was Old Hickory, and you can find his home um, right outside of Nashville, Tennessee. So if you're up that way, you may want to go see his his home. And um, Connecticut's capital is Hartford. That's right, Hartford, Connecticut. So that is the capital of, of Connecticut. All right, until next time, uh, I'll see you on YouTube. Email me if you have any questions. Bye-bye.